I've kind of seen the scope of this talk since I sent in the abstract. Uh, now I want to talk about essentially two things. Firstly, I want to talk about reorganizing the current policy documents. Because there is more than one document. And uh, I'm not really happy with the content of the current technical policy document itself. The second thing that I'm not happy about is the policy change process. Uh, there have been, it's currently kind of stalled, and Russ and I are the only ones actually active on the policy change, and there have been, I don't know, several hundred bugs that are on the BTS, and that scare me enough that I don't like going in and looking at them because it depresses me. Uh, and most of these things are books which are stuck in a state of limbo. I don't know if the discussion is over or uh, I'm not a domain expert and there have been enough contradictory testimony in there that I'm not sure which way I should jump. And I'm scared of jumping the wrong way because the last time I did so, a whole bunch of people jumped on me and called me names. And I, that was not exactly pleasant. So, before we jump into some of the rather radical suggestions that I'm going to bring forth today, I wanted to do a little meta introduction. Why do we need things like policy? What does policy do? What are the different kinds of policy documents or policy life documents that we have floating around? Uh, so there are a number of different things. The main one that drove the uh, technical policy document was we are creating an OS, we are integrating bunches of uh, software written by all kinds of people and there is uh, only a bare minimum of uh, matrix or structure that pulls these things together. The FHS is one such effort that kind of provided some kind of guidelines. But that doesn't address the uh, things to the level of debate, uh, detail that we must. Uh, apart from the integration requirements, there are the system packaging interface, how maintenance scripts are to be called. Uh, there is also the fact that I think we ought to be able to say that you call deep package gen control to generate the control file or, or gen changes or other parts of the packaging infrastructure, but I'm not sure how far I we go in that. Because some of that is just, you know, the calling interface of the package, the deep package itself, and maybe it shouldn't be in policy. There are upgrade requirements, the release team wants smooth updates from previous version to the next version. That has some implications on how you do your packaging. There are QA standards that uh, are designed to reduce bugs. Uh, the library symbol versioning stuff that we are talking about is one of these kind of things. Uh, the, the developer's reference is chock full of best practices and it's a compendium of devs. And there are other such documents with them. And for a new developer, just getting into Debian, there are all kinds of how to's and walk through them. Uh, but they're scattered all over the place. Uh, and then the contents of all these documents is different. There are some things which are absolutely required for integration. You don't do that, your package breaks or the release breaks and the release manager come and hit you on the head with a hammer. Uh, there are some things where the project has decided on features to provide. User changes in configuration files are never lost, or should not be lost when you do a package update. This is a feature that was decided by the project as something that we support. This is, there's no reason, there's not an integration issue, it is a user support feature. There are other such things that we have. And then there are things that, you know, for the most part, are the things that you ought to do. And if there are exceptions to the rule, you should be able to defend that your package falls into such an exception. Uh, this is thanks to Joey, he mentioned that there might be things that we might 
make mandatory in the future, but we are just trying it out and we are waiting out while you know, people implement it. This is one of the current failures in policy. There is no way to stage a complex trans uh, change that might require a transition period. Well, we did do a pre user share dog. Uh -huh. sort of. Don't talk about that to me. But that was one of my major fiascos. Um, build arch and build in depth uh, targets is a good example of this particular problem. Right. That one's been floating around for a long time now. And how long has it taken us? to do the user share doc transition and hasn't yet finished? Seven or eight years. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't hold that up by something that policy Yeah, but, with. but it wasn't particularly the fault that it wasn't in policy, right? People didn't do the right thing, but it didn't happen. It was the fault of the actual mechanism we chose to do it with in the end. Okay. I, so. I always hard it from my part. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was our fault for not saying, well, let's wait to release, change the package to actually have the feature that we need to just move the directory in one atomic step and be done with it. Yeah. <laughs> At that point of time, getting changes into the package was uh, harder than getting changes into quality is right now. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, then there are things which are nice to have, but are not critical, which. Uh, there are lots of things like that in the middle of the system. And there are aesthetically pleasing things and subjective best qualities like not having a period at the end of your short description. Which really is once about and I always override. I think that is looking still on about that? I don't know because I would never see it. <laughs> <laughs> there were various different tests on the short description that we ended up taking out. I don't know if that was one of them. The capital letter one I know is not there anymore. Okay. So, we have used this broad categorization. There are things that maintainers must do, or it causes a decrease in the quality or the features that do it implement. Things that maintainers should do or demonstrate that their case is exception. And then there are things that are just mere recommendations. This is the must should main thing in policy. And uh, I'm open to whether we need to increase the number of categories that we have. I don't see how we could, but uh, these need not be set in stone. Other standards organizations tend to follow that particular free level thing as well. So. But we are subtly different from the IETF, for example, in what we mean yes. by these words. Okay. What are the current problems with the policy document? And this is my take on it. I'm sure other people have things to add. The current policy is bloated. It started its life as the package uh, documentation. Julian and I shoved a whole lot of things. Uh, we pulled a lot of things in from the packaging manual, which used to be separate, and we threw a whole lot of things out. I have to say. Uh, but I don't think we ever finished <coughs> this. And I think we kind of burnt out before we actually were through. Uh, subsequently, the must should me labels are not consistent or correct. If they were consistent and correct, we would never need the release team to give us the list of <coughs> RC bugs. At this point, I have no idea how many policy documents there are. I know there is the Perl policy, there is the x strike force policy, there is the menu policy, there is an Emacs policy. <coughs> there ought to be a Python policy, but there isn't really. There is a PAM policy, sort of. There is a Kerberos policy, sort of. There's the Web Apps policy, sort of. There's a tech policy, which I think is more of a, is less sort of and more real. There's a car policy. There are a couple others as well. I want to develop all of these, and I guess I can kind of sort of say the AC Linux policy, but... <laughs> so, in one, th in one thing that has not happened is the... It, used to, it seems like it used, it used to be that those policy documents would eventually have a goal of migrating into the Debian policy package and being included with it. For the more recent policies that have shown up, that process doesn't seem to be happening. 
No. There's a lot of policy process that's not happening, but that's that's one of them. And I think that it, it, it's not clear now to people who are developing policies that the Debian policy central package is actually interested in incorporating their policies. And I think we would like, I'd like to get, personally, I'd like to get back to that point. I think there's a lot of value in having a single document where if you're not packaging a tech package, you just ignore that part. But E injection alone meaning this kind of said that any policy is equal to any other policy. So I'm trying to say if I upload a package with a policy document in it, what value does it have? So it has the same uh, value as say the technical policy or the current policy or anything else. I kind of don't agree with that because from a maintainer's viewpoint that's untenable. There are what, ten thousand source packages out there? Mm -hmm. If any one of them might have uploaded a policy which is which affects my packages, how the heck am I supposed to know? I mean, I don't even think I have looked at the user share doc of all the packages I even install. I know I'm supposed to, but I don't really. I mean, how many people do? For the gold. All right. So we need to have some idea how many there. They're also getting, because there's so many of these things floating around, it's getting really hard to tell if your package is policy compliant. And there's that question of, uh, not every single rule that we have in policy has a clear rationale. And it might have been clear to the people who first got it into policy, but those people are long gone. We have no idea why it is there. And uh, from time to time, there is discussion on why dot slash Debian slash rule should be a make file, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, the best that we have is occasionally you find a bug reference, and then that bug reference came from a mailing list thread about the same time. And you have to, uh, uh, yeah, don't do yes. so. I would like to change this aspect of policy. And of course, there's, if, I don't know how many of you attended my previous talk. I would like to have pseudocode for uh, that helps policy compliant checkers like Lintian and Linda be talked about at the same time as we are talking about the policy change itself. So it is clearer to the people doing the checks what exactly we mean. Uh, one, one easy way to do that, well, one more straightforward approach there rather than as an alternative to embedding it in policy is to require everybody who submits a policy, a proposed policy change to include diffs to at least one of Linda and Linda. Yeah, I, I kind of like... Uh, uh, something that you didn't put into one the other one. Yeah. Yes. yeah there, there, are some pol there are some things that we may want to debate as possible policy changes which don't really make sense to approach that way. Yeah. A good example would be say that we wanted to debate whether we wanted all init scripts to follow the LSB init script standard. Right, it's very, it's nice. very difficult to, particularly the output formats, it's very difficult to write a Lithium check for that. You can, ch you can test whether it part at least tries to follow it, which is about the best. Yeah. Well, I would rather, as far as possible, try to be language neutral. Uh, Linda is in Python, Lithium is Perl, and uh, there might be other things which are written in OCaml that are, or something. Apple. <laughs> <laughs> C. So my <laughs> radical, <laughs> so my radical proposition number one is that we get rid of the current set of policy documents, and we start writing a new technical policy document from scratch. And here is my case for it. Uh, the current policy, as I said, is bloated. Started as defective documentation. We don't know what the mushroom clause is. It hasn't actually been written by a consistent editorial policy in place. Uh, it rambles, has meanders. The language is different. It changes uh, from first person, you know, active voice to passive voice as you go from one paragraph to the next. Uh, there are tense changes that go on in the same section. Uh, that, so it would just become a more pleasant document to read. Thanks to Joey Hess, we might want to, policy can be sliced and diced two ways. You might want to say that, is my package compliant with all the, you do this or 
the release tree into the hammer that you kind of wrote. If it were nice, if we could have a small little section that says, these are the must rules. These are the should. You probably should do these rules. And then there is the rest of the stuff. It, on the other hand, if I'm working with an X package and I kind of know the rest of it, I want to know what are the X specific clauses. So I want to see all the clauses, must, should, and random tips about X it in one place instead of having to go hunting through. So I am proposing that we use doc book for the new policy manual. This will allow us to create an overarching multi-part book. Each part in this policy book can be what is currently accepted policy document. So you can start with technical policy as one part and the developers, developers reference at the last part and all these Perl, Python, I've forgotten the list that we came up with. All those things can be separate parts. Menu, X, and Y. So, so you, you mentioned at the start that policy started as deep package documentation and uh, one, of the, one of the things that's been an issue over the last few years is that while we don't want uh, to have certain kinds of best practice deep package op operating deep package documentation, a deep package developer's manual I think is the term, while we don't want to have it in policy, nobody's actually written a deep package developer's manual. Um, they can take the current policy if they want to. So, so, what I, so what I was going to ask was, uh, if once we once we are in a position where we can uh, include and exclude, slice and dice the complete policy manual, is it possible that the deep package developers manual could once again find a home in that in that assembly? I I hope that the deep package maintainers feel free to take whatever they want from this current policy manual. Mm -hmm. uh, we do need to figure out, and I don't know where, how to do so, is uh, there are things which are deep internal documentation of how the program works. Sure. On the other hand, there are also things that package maintainers ought to be able to depend on. They are kind of packaging uh, interface, so to say. But there are and things that there are things that you must do that are deep package operational instructions that you must do if you're going to interoperate properly with other packages, but that are also, in some sense, they're also part, they also ought to be part of the deep package man page, man page suites. So <coughs> they fall in a, in a pathway house between uh, deep package documentation and policy. Well, I kind of think of this as similar to uh, APIs, right? You, if you write a library, you have an API that you publish. There are also optional parts about things that you optionally allow, but they are not part of the strict API that you are also providing. And similarly, dpackage has to provide a certain set of functionality. For example, dpackage had better create a .dev file <laughs> by some invocation or the other. This is not something that dpackage maintainer can say, oh, we decided not to do that anymore. I think it's kind of an interesting question as to whether or not uh, it should be, whether or not policy ideally should contain, should be independent of the specific implementation of uh, the package installation program that we happen to be using. In other words, should the policy document say uh, Debian package is an AR archive that consists of two members, a control and, you know, a, and data, I mean, does, do we want to dive into that level or do we want to just say you have to use dpackage and be done with it? I mean, if you were writing like an IETF standard, you wouldn't say you have to use dpackage. You would say right. it's an AR archive, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, um, I, I think that we want to talk about what we want maintainers to use. I mean, we don't want maintainers to build devs on the, by hand unless they're doing something weird, you know? Right. Yeah. So, so I really want to say in policy, you, this is how this is what you put together to get your dev. I mean, this is, this is how you get your dev. Okay. Call the package dev dash it's, it's, it's kind of useful to have that sort of interface specified yeah, because you can nice to write tools that go and look at on that basis. Yeah. 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 And, and that allows us to change some things here. I've, in the I've certainly written that. tools that use R and sure. because it's faster to because because than running the package. But that too. Um, in my case, so yeah, there are two levels of things to One is the spec for the packaging system itself. Yes. 
And that is what we are talking about, yes. that the packaging system has this spec. Yes. We, did, we might not want that to be here. What we are talking about is the other end. I don't care about the spec for the package. I want to care about what package maintainers need to know how to talk to our packaging system. It seems to me like we definitely need to see if we can engage the packaging maintainers now that there's a somewhat more active team into taking on some of this stuff. I would really, I mean, the thing is, is that we are going to have a policy team, and that policy team is not going to be depackage experts. No. And, and in fact, I would like policy to... Policy team should be depackage experts in some level. Well, in, in some level, really. but, you know, well, well, I can tell you, you know, roughly the, 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 the you might what, not, a, what a dev okay, looks you, like. I don't you might not need to know how process archive works, but right. you, you do need to know what the... Yeah, and this, the detailed specification of exactly how the dev is put together, I would really rather have the depackage maintainers be maintaining that instead of having policy maintainers maintain that. The, for among other things, I mean, while there's going to be a policy team that's like the core team, I would really like to have, uh, be able to draw in people who are not that intimately sure. familiar. Sure. One other thing that's going to come up in the rest of the talk is that we're going to follow up on domain experts in every aspect of policy change. And depackage maintainers are I have done my share of hacking of the package, and I'm one of the few people who have managed not to disappear after working on the package, which is what happens for every package maintainer. So my, my concern is uh, simply to uh, try to make sure that things don't get taken out of policy for good and right reasons, but nevertheless taken out of policy and without disappear. ending up with it and just disappearing yeah. into the ether. One point, uh, maybe. Uh, the policy uh, concentrates a lot about explaining the package relationships. And uh, it could perhaps, uh, the part where the policy may or may not want to dictate which of the tools at which level uh, uh, has to follow this specification. You know, uh, it, when it says a recommends field, uh, the, of course the policy should mention the recommend field because the packagers want to use it. But uh, the policy may or may not want to dictate which part of the packaging suit uh, enforces the field. You know, DPKG doesn't care about it, but APT does. So the policy is orthogonal, is uh, above the whole issue. So the policy should describe the behavior that is expected of the packaging system. And the system is but a whole, not just yeah. DPKG. Oh, right, and don't care about the actual invocation yeah. of which part. Right. But, but the behavior changes all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But we don't want, we want the behavior to be consistent yes. so the package maintainer can rely on certain behavior. That if I put something in my control file, this is how it will affect my package. If I put something in my maintainer script, this is how my maintainer script will be called and this is the action that will be taken. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think there's a place for informational notes that we happen to know that this is broken at the moment. Say, remember, recommends was broken in DSNAC for years. Yeah. Um, um, uploaders, the, up, uploaders currently can't be wrapped with the old stable D package. Right. That's a good example. Yeah, so, um, it's, well, so I think it's still okay. worth noting. This is, how, this, how we want to, this, this is how we want it to work, but we know that there are apparently these problems. Are good. Yeah. You posted a bug against policy seven years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so did I. We thought about About the copyright of the current policy. <laughs> I have no yeah. clue. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> so, probably so, so we must have. Right old, so Ian it. wrote a lot of that, uh, right? He started it. It's a deep package yeah. documentation, right? So Ian wrote a lot of that. Can we just go and grab him? Because <laughs> <laughs> Ian is one of the people. But then there since are, then, yeah. Christian there Schwartz, there were and uh, lots of people have added. Well, everybody who created the policy bug was a patch. Well, we have to chase down like all these guys and ask them what copyright we want from this. And make sure that they have the same copyright, or, as I said, throw policy out. Start from scratch, create a quick, consistent copyright for this, and make everybody who wants to put in anything agree to that statement. So the, the big concern I have about throwing it out and, and, and starting over, um, I mean, I, I think that what you get at the end of that, it might be really nice, but it has the same problem as whenever anybody thinks about fixing a software package by throwing it out and rewriting it, is that you often end up with a different set of bugs and you end up with a giant lag between when you throw out the old one and when you have a workable other one. That is true. Yeah. But, uh, but the thing is, I think with policy, there is this adage which says, you always throw out your first implementation and your second implementation. I, I would say that, right, I mean, a giant lag 
where nothing is happening is basically where we all where we are right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also, unlike software, you can refer to two policy documents at once. It would yeah, totally yeah. suck. Yeah. But you can do it. I, I think it's uh, my, uh, I I contend that way before learning is frozen, we can have new document How many pages is policy? Do you know how many? Many. Well, many pages. Like no, about but the, or something. Well, well, the thing is, if we actually start going through the review process, we, you will find that it won't be that many pages. Yeah. So one, one, thi one thing I say about copyright is that, it's, and it, is that changes that were submitted once, once you know, once, it, once, there, once there is at least a copyright that you can look at, whether yeah. it's true or not, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say that people submitting patches at that point either, either agreed to that copyright or were being ne negligent. Uh, and I think a, a, not a lawyer, but I think a court. I think you mean license yeah. rather than copyright. Sorry, I mean copy. I mean yeah. not license. Yes, you're correct. Okay. So I should mention one thing. Uh, the package and manual uh, integration was actually not an integration. It was just slapped on <laughs> onto the document at first. It's slapped on in part. In part. It was slapped on in part. We didn't take every. Yeah, uh, like three appendices. Right. Yes. And I still have to go back and refer to the old pulp packaging yeah. manual for a couple of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we skip yeah. <laughs> I think I'd have to dig it up from archive. Don't they still document. have bits and pieces in the appendix? Yes, yes. 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 not all of them. Because uh, no, some, 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 some of it is a uh, reference so manual for DPKG, yeah, exactly. and some of it is a specification. So there's two sections describing changeable files. One describes the idea, <laughs> which it should really, <laughs> and the other describes the well, format, yeah. the idea of the format. And format. they're about 50, pa 50 yeah. pages apart. So they're yeah, also yeah. the policy uh, document. And actually, uh, and I, uh, I, I was fixing it, but I wasn't uh, brave enough to actually rip it out <laughs> all and uh, yeah. combine it into one section. And I just uh, ripped out the most obvious parts, uh, cross-referenced both. And then uh, posted the patch and say, uh, said, uh, okay, this patch does something. And it was like 150 kilobytes of plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. <laughs> and I don't think anyone actually read the patch. <laughs> uh, they, they just said, okay, Joe is doing something. It should be good. <laughs> let's just look at the final version. Okay, it looks as confused as the before. Okay, let's go in. Let's go in. <laughs> and for a dog, it even talks about the ability to plug in different change log formats. <laughs> Yeah, in one of those sections. Yes. <laughs> Not sure which one, but somewhere. That would be a great example of something that policy should just say, you don't get to do that anymore. Sorry, we have one change log format. Yeah. All right. Has, so, nobody's ever uh, used that. So, if we do go well, ahead and start a new policy document, the new document can be built in every policy rule that comes in. It can have a normative section, a rationale, informative additional notes, and packet checking pseudo code, which is language neutral and kind of sorted. It is sometimes easier to express some things in pseudo code than it is in English. Mm -hmm. I would also like to say that if we go with uh, SGML or XML documents, you can do uh, SGML entity de uh, declarations. So you can have, at the end, you can have policy document based, uh, uh, ordered by priority, you know, all the must things come in and so on. And you can have this similar policy document which says this is ordered by subject and in the subject you pull in all the rules belonging to subject. Yeah. So if we, every time a rule comes in, if we can identify the severity, is it a must, is it a should, is it one of those, you know, that is it And you can spe Sorry. Sorry. specify the subject. In, it would, and I know that specifying categorization is always hard and we'll probably have to come back and redo it. Uh, so, but that is going to be, you know, making consistent categorization in the ninth order hierarchy of subjects is probably easier to do with this new format than it is to go ahead and change our country. Well, there should be a Debian policy command that you can give, like per doc minus Q or whatever, um, there should be a command yeah. that you can give a category and a spits you out the policy for it. Yeah. So I want, I do want to move away from Debian Doc onto uh, Docbook because I get indices and cross references and I can slice and dice and create. So the matrix of the document, the overarching document can be informative and we can say only the things that are pulled in, all these policy dictums that are pulled in, only those parts are normative. So you can put in a matrix of nice uh, introductory material and 
all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Is Ardo still developing Debian Doc? Or is he? He <laughs> maintain, he's, no, if Debian Doc, if it gets a bug, it will get fixed. There are no features being added. Okay. Okay. Doc book, on the other hand, seems to be fairly alive. There's a large community, and you can convert Doc book format into any kind of output format. RTF, I've seen. So, I mean, as a policy contributor, one of the things that I would have, I would want, uh, if, if we were going to use DocBook, is I would want a style guide that specifies what DocBook tags we're actually going to yes. use, because DocBook has like 5,000 tags, and they're just, it's insane. I spend, anytime I write DocBook, I spend more time reading the DocBook documentation than I do actually writing right. DocBook yeah. code. Adding a new section of policy or just filling out of some template. Yes. We, we, yeah, <coughs> and that, is, that should be easy enough to do. And I yeah. have bought the DocBook book. I haven't actually read yeah. it yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if someone is willing to, to if you, for example, would be willing to write a, a style guide that says, you know, thou shalt use the following tag for the following purpose. Uh, that would that would make it way, <coughs> way greatly reduce the barrier of entry for 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 trying to use DocBook to do policy. And the indentation guide. <laughs> I yeah. like the indentations mess. Now mess. we uh, this is the other thing. Policy is inconsistent. We need to review it, and it will be nice, especially if you're going to make a more formal structure for each rule, as opposed to just writing paragraphs which might have one or two or zero actual policy rules in them, depending on the paragraph. Uh, I think it will make policy easier to read. I mean, one of the things that I definitely want to do out of, when I get out of any kind of a policy review is that we, we have this odd situation right now, and this is what you brought up earlier, where there, there's, there's a, the release team determines the RC bugs for a particular mm -hmm. release, and policy has a set of musts. Um, and okay. I, think that, I think that some degree, I think that we should allow ourselves uh, a couple of, a, a bit of divergence between those two things for any given release. I think the release manager should be able to say, you know, look, there's this sure. one must which we're just not going to enforce for this release for because it's going hard. to delay the release or something. Months. But I think that, you know, I think that we should be back into a position where you can assume that if it says must in policy, it's an RC bug for the release unless there's a special exception listed. And I don't feel like we're there right now. No, so, we, not there. so we can so we can sort of start off from the uh, the goals document. That's uh, the release team put together right. back in AJ's tenure, I think, and uh, that persisted through mine and the current release. Right. So if we did one, and, and that's that's written in an attempt to be this style of policy policy dictums rather than the informative notes, and uh, it's just that I shall do the following things. These, this is the authoritative list of musts. Which makes me think that if we, you know, if we do start uh, this kind of a, a rewrite, one of the ways that you can start on that is write all the RC bugs first. And then go back and start going through the current policy manual, looking for the shoulds and the musts that didn't make the RC bug list. And then you have, if we have this period where we have two policies, which we're going to end up with, we if, we, if, we have, if we have this, if the we goal is to get is merge them before Lenny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then at least we can have maybe the new policy can very quickly become the release policy. It has all the critical stuff, and then we can migrate the rest of the stuff over as we can find the horsepower. Okay. And this is this is the scary part. We do need help from everybody else. Yeah. Just the two of us. It ain't gonna happen. It, it ain't gonna happen. So, I, and I'm actually, we are looking for people <coughs> who have demonstrated, uh, you know, motivation and desire to work on policy to come join the team. So I think that because I can really think the situation we're going to be in is that if if we don't get a lot of people actively interested in contributing to this kind of document, we're gonna we're gonna have to just maintain the current document in some fashion or another because it I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure how long we can this is getting to be too onerous a burden to maintain. Uh, the current structure in a manner that does justice to the project. Because we are not serving the project the way the policy is or the policy team processes right now. So I would, if we can't get some of these radical changes in and get to the point where I think it is sustainable, uh, I, I am going to just ask for somebody else to take over and I'm going to step out of it. I don't think we can, this is sustainable right now. 
are you referencing just to the state of the document or the state of the practices? The procedures, the, the procedures too. And that's the second part of the talk, yeah, yeah. and I'm running out of time. <laughs> we should let you continue because the procedures yeah, are pretty important. Yeah, do that. Okay. Uh, some material will have to move to other places like GPACS documentation, developers reference. And I think there is some stuff in developer's reference that actually should migrate back up. But, but <coughs> block book and multi-part books, we can have a one-stop place where you can get one gigantic 1,200-page document, maybe, <laughs> that starts off with a five-page... And it all as part of the yeah. intent of process. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it starts off with a, maybe a two-page thing that says, these are the RC bugs, these are the shirts, and then pulls in other things like Emacs policy or MIME policy. Is there a MIME policy? I guess so. Ouch. <laughs> Where is it? It's in the policy. It's in the David policy, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. like a menu, MIME, uh, Perl. Oh, they, I know there are menu policies there, but yeah. I don't There's know. There's also MIME policy. Yes, yeah, in MIME policy. Nobody it's notices it's because policy. it's three letters difference. <laughs> It's, it's like a page and a half. Wait, so I think, we're, I think so we're, this concludes the changing the current structure. So essentially, uh, what we have done is say this doc book, HTML entity, so you can slice and dice the policy document. So depending on whether you want it priority based or you want it subject based, can be done. Uh, provide a matrix where we can pull in other policy documents, so to create an overarching document that you can give to the new maintainer, say go, spend five years, read through all this, come back. What's the 40 word on the second page? <laughs> <laughs> what, one, th one thing I'd like to have with my other hat on is that um, I'd, I'd like to be in a position where uh, Ubuntu could add a few bits saying these are the things that we do differently, here are the things you must do as an original package, and potentially have those be referenceable in some way from... Yeah, for them and with you know, the colour, uh, white on white, <laughs> so <laughs> they don't show up. And some, dog, some, way, dog, way, dog, yeah. some way of actually merging it. Yeah, 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 you define your own and then use the same. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So and we can have a common glossary. I mean, we have never had a decent glossary or an index or anything in policy. And uh, I think that it should be doable with... Uh, so if, another thing I would be interested in seeing is, if we're talking about changing the document structure and so on, uh, an XML transform that lets you spit out each of the musts in a list. Yeah, we talked about that. We're basically talking about two. Beyond the structure policy, you can, there are going to be two matrix documents. One matrix document does it by Priority. So you get all the musts first, and then you get all the shoulds and everything else after. And the second thing, which pulls in from the same set of XML entities, gives you the same thing by uh, category. category or subject. Right. So basically, we could, um, and this policy is going to have a fair amount of explanatory text explaining why yeah. things are common. Yeah. So we, 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 we should have more. Top, top thing in the projector. <laughs> <thing. laughs> it should have more than it does now, in fact. Uh -huh. But in terms of having the, being able to show what is or at least critical for release, yeah, yeah, right. So the idea is, is that what I what I'm what I'm envisioning here is that a, poli a typical policy section is going to have, um, you know, a severity level, a subject, the actual rule, uh, ex an additional explain informative rationale of why, with a, in a separate section of why we have this rule, and then you know possibly pseudocode for package checking, and then you can apply an XML transform and pull out whichever of those pieces you want, including. So the link and guys can just apply XML XSLT transform to pull out just pseudo code. So then they can you know, make sure that they've got a policy blessed version of the uh, pseudo code. If you if you want to include all the other policies into the main document, that's the bit also mean rewriting those to the new structure. Mm -hmm. and as long as they are written in some kind of HTML, we ought to be able to just say that include that as a chapter or as a part in this. But yes, I, I but expect that. I would like to see everything move to... I mean, that would be a much harder task. Yeah. Well, most of, them, most of them are pretty small. Most of the other supplementary ones are actually not that large. And some crazy person... Policy is a 
has already written a block to a Debian block to block both XSL and XSL. So, one idea. Uh, these current sections, uh, chapters in policy, mm -hmm. they are actually uh, documents on their own. You could have a different operating system as a document, you know, and that's one thing we can agree about, you know, and one, one document that could be called a Debian uh, policy on programming languages, and then it would uh, transclude all the Perl and Python and stuff, because uh, uh, in the interest of readability, you know, yeah. when you say uh, tasks and skills, uh, tell people just read the operating system part, like, Sure, the, the one that we are going to do by subject, the structure of that, poli that policy, that version of the policy document yeah. but, can indeed be... But still, uh, the table of contents that is uh, three pages long <laughs> is still intimidating, so yeah. splitting it up is actually okay. Well, uh, at least nesting it so it's a... Nesting or something. Yeah. Right, yeah. The, uh, we can, all of this can be hammered out as long right. as we agree on the... Base principles. Right. Yeah. We write the components, and I think we can dice, slice and dice it however we want at the end and figure out which looks the best. What, what yeah. other and you don't have to. Sorry. Go ahead, now. Uh, you don't have to have a static set of. Most of these, the matrix documents that I'm calling them, are not normative. So you can have any number of. You can create your own. This is my view of the policy document. As long as you have. What are the database terms? As long as you have good precision and uh, good coverage, then it doesn't matter which order you're presenting it in. One, one thing I'd like to have that I guess sort of feeds into a reorganized document is uh, Lintin has these refer has policy chapter number references, mm -hmm. and uh, I've not done it for a long time, I don't know if you have, Russ, but uh, going through and updating the Policy number references is a uh, chore. I think, Frank, I think Frank did it a little while back. It's a oh, ghastly chore. Yeah. And some kind of permalink that just identifies yeah. the name mm -hmm. of well, the. Well, the, 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 the pseudo code like that we'll be putting in could have a UUID or well, some. Well, well, I'll just say a name. Oh, a new anchor. Yeah. Well, it's rather long in the output then. If you're using anchors for the Lintian output, how are you going to output? Oh, it's a, thing that, it's a thing that says ref colon policy 10.1 or whatever. Right. And um, having just, just policy it. short string. Well, so what, what, what you do is, okay. is that for the web page yeah, output, you turn it into a link, into a URL. Yeah, okay. And for the, the output to the right. console, you, you for the output to the console, you, you need to maintain a database of, of hyper refs to title, to chapter titles. And then you. if we've got a Debian policy command, you can type Debian policy name. Yeah, or, or yeah, you can map it to a number for the current. Right, right, right. right. But, you know, we should Part continue. two, yeah, we're yeah, two sorry. minutes late getting into the second half of this. Uh, I'm not happy with the current policy change process. Before I go on and describe what's wrong with it and how I think we can fix it, I want to uh, have a look at what I think are the goals of uh, the policy change process. The first thing is that we obviously want changes that are going in to be technically correct. We, they should be somewhat consistent with the rest of policy because, well, I don't know why. It makes it easier reading, it makes Shit. different principle of least surprise. I just want the policy to be a consistent document. Uh, this means that you don't leave <coughs> the value of pi, you don't go about talking about things which aren't true. It also means that the proposed solution should be named, named to work. You just shouldn't just, you know, uh, what in the U.S. is known as the Hail Mary pass. Mm, uh, you know, you just throw the football up in the air and you hope that somebody is at the other end is going to catch it and you get a goal. Uh, we, want, we don't want to do an iterative design process through policy changes. It would be nice to have proposed policy. <coughs> These are the things that are on their way in, maybe. If, uh, if you are planning on doing something like this, then here is what some other people are doing so that we don't end up with iterative design by committees who aren't talking to each other. Yeah. Right. And there is, we need, the, the policy process has to become far more transparent. And I've got proposals in for that. Uh, this is our user share doc change rule. <laughs> <laughs> the change should not be too disruptive. Very many packages will become instantly buggy. Then there should be a transition plan. There can be exceptions to this. This is not 
you, we haven't usually had exceptions to this so far. But I'm saying that exceptions should be there, but they should be permissible. But if there is going to be an exception like this, where the policy change can cause packages to become instantly buggy all at once, I don't want to be in the hot seat. I want the rest of the technical committee to be in the prime pan with me. I think that's a great idea involving the technical committee in these decisions. It gives the technical committee more to do, among yeah. other things. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to do right now. Um, well, it, the ALJ is complaining about that. So. Right. <laughs> I don't think that was ever his complaint. Um, <laughs> Um, in, terms of, in terms of policy, um, not making the insta buggy, yeah, um, the mantra that has been repeated over and over for years is policy is not a stick to beat maintainers with. And I don't remember who originated that saying. People have been misquoting me for years. <laughs> <laughs> I did actually say that. So there's, well, but, um, and in, even in terms of some interactions that I recall, I don't remember who had with you as the policy maintainer, there seems to be this gap where, um, we need, it, it's certainly within the bailout of policy to decide how packages should behave so that they can interoperate on some particular point. Um, and in practice today, those packages are not interacting with each other properly. So in effect, I would say they are already buggy in that they are not, they do not form a cohesive group of packages, but there still seems to be a difficulty in getting um, policy wording in place even when a decision seems to have been Agreed upon. A lot of this happened before the delegation. Okay. Because I didn't believe that I had the right to go make changes in policy. Okay. Because I there was I didn't see any power devolving to me. I just random Joe developer who happened to be in the proper group on master. So I had to commit right to policy. I didn't say I had the right to make the changes. Now that we are proper delegates, I see us maybe with the backing from the technical committee to actually have the right to make this kind of changes yeah. and tell the workers to you know, you check it. I mean, the other point about that is, is that, you know, and it push comes to show, I mean, the Constitution says that the technical committee is a stick to be maintainers with. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> the, release team, the release team has always really yeah. desperately wanted a stick and to be maintainers it, with. And if, it, if it's controversial, then maybe we can make more use of the technical committee to say, look, the, okay, it's controversial, we just, we just made a decision, this is the decision. You know, this is, we're following the Debian, the Debian governance model, and okay. let's go forward. Okay, the next thing about policy changes, the change has to be reviewed in depth. It has to be in the open. Uh, AJ was scared about star chamber sessions where decisions are made. So I say that we should decree that if anybody can contribute to where the discussion, it should be held on a publicly accessible, archived, open mailing list that we already have, yeah. Debian policy. There should be no policy decision made in behind the scenes by people unknown and suddenly there is a new policy dictum that everybody has to follow. Yeah. Or on the IRC where that can't be the laws. Well, there can I be laws on IRC, but... The wrong, yeah. I have complete laws despite what people say about that. Yeah. The, the one thing the that IRC... Up 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 the, the one thing about IRC, though, too, is... You're just quoting me at that point because I only said you can't post your logs on websites. The, the one thing about IRC though too is, is that and, you know it works for some of us and not for others. I'm not particularly an IRC person. I'm happy to use IRC if I need to for a particular purpose, but I'm unlikely to kind of hang out there in general. And it's just it's an interaction style thing. Okay. And the next thing that I've got here for a goal for policy, which has never been the case, policy proposals should be addressed in a timely fashion. <laughs> I'm going to put a strict time limit. Either your policy proposal goes through and whatever time limit we choose, one month, two months, or else it gets dropped. Or it gets handed over to the technical committee, or it gets handed over to the developer to throw out into the form of a GR. It just doesn't keep on hanging on the BTS for the policy forever with no action being taken. I thought that's what the current process already said, but I'm mm. misremembering. Ah. The current process kind of says that, but it doesn't entirely. It doesn't, it doesn't, I don't think it specifies actions to be taken. No, it, it doesn't action. say that there is going to be a limit on the discussion. Right. It right. said the discussion. You can leave the discussion unlimited in the current uh, yeah. procedure. Okay. I also, before I was a delegate, I couldn't, I didn't say I had the right to say that this person I'm going to trust more, and even though there are five people who say the opposite, I'm going to go with what this guy said. Even if I know that person to be the domain expert, 
if Joey and France tell me something about the way the way installer works and should, such should be the policy or unit, I don't care if there are 50 people who have just gone through NM telling me that that's not the way DI works and they shouldn't be working that way if it does. Domain experts, I think we should treat especially and now I think we have the right being delegates to actually make a decision and say this guy is a domain expert, I'm going to listen to him. The goal is still a rough consensus. I don't want the politics. Policy maintainers are not domain experts in everything. They shouldn't be driving the way willy-nilly. There are times when we can't tell if there's a consensus or what should be done. Uh, there are things, uh, hey, I, I thought I knew about symbol versioning, but it turns out I don't. So I might not know what is the right decision if, they, if they, I get two different experts telling me, you know, like in a court, two expert witnesses tell us talk exactly the opposite way. We need to be able to shove it back up to the technical committee. Those are the guys who are, you know, long beards, white head, hair, etc. <laughs> so, and there any non-technical issue that we can't decide, which is just a matter of uh, subjective aesthetics, we shove it back to the developer body and we say that this is the policy team can't deal with this, we don't know which way to go, you guys decide. Uh, the next thing that we have been warned about is package maintainers who are affected by policy changes sometimes are unaware that something happened that needs their attention. And this needs to be improved. We need to be proactive about finding people who are going to be affected by policy changes and getting their input in. This is the place where I think we can borrow a model from the IETF in that if we say, if we've reached a rough consensus on the policy mailing list, that's the point at which we should accumulate whatever we've reached a rough consensus on okay. on a regular basis. Yeah, I've got this in the, this is the goal. Policy as a state machine. State A is we've detected in some recent days of flaw in policy, I've got a new proposal, we are in state A. State B is when we have had some discussion and there somebody has got some kind of a solution in place. We don't have the perfect solution, but we are kind of getting there. This is state C's option, you call in the guys who actually know what they are talking about. State D is we are close to a working solution, you create the policy language, rational tests, etc. We are nearly there. Then this is kind of controversial. I thought that I would like to have a bunch of people. Either a policy maintainer who is not a proposer to sign off on it if they know what the domain is, or some number of people uh, who are in the domain say that this thing looks same. I don't want to have to come to this point where I have no idea what people are talking about. This proposal has come through. I don't know what the ramifications are, what the impact might be. I want, just like in the Linux kernel menu, you can say, I sign off onto this proposal. I want a bunch of people to sign off on it before it goes any further. Mm, I'd be worried about codifying that too much, but this is okay. this is not going to be this is not the process. This is my I I was trying to be funny. I thought the people would understand say sure. The result states are either the change is accepted or we decided it's not a policy matter. It timed out because we couldn't reach a conclusion and no policy was created or we couldn't find a solution at all. Or we refer it to the technical committee as being too hard for us to poor policy folk and we give it to the TC to, you know, the wise guys. We refer it to the developer body. <coughs> or we just kind of reject it and if the delegates reject it, it goes straight to the technical committee to overview. I don't know. I mean, you want to have the technical committee work on every single I think it only, I think it only, goes to the technical committee if the people who proposed it yeah, if they decide they want to appeal. They disagree. I, I just didn't want to give the policy, being a policy delegate, I didn't want to give me the power of rejecting things out of mm -hmm. hand without there being any review. Well, if you yeah. want the review to be if somebody, well, anybody can call in on the technical committee anytime they want, and maybe I should just remove this. Part. I think asking the, yeah. the proposal to, the proposal to appeal if they want to is reasonable. Okay. So, I propose we continue using the BTS, but I say suggest we use the user tags to monitor progress. Yeah. And we use automated mails to remind us about 
milestones and I also want to propose something called the Wheel Policy Announce. This is no discussion goes there. When you are close to formulating a policy, you send mail to announce, people should look on the mail to announce to see if their packages are affected. By the time stuff goes to announce, you, you have a fleshed out solution, your problem, rationale, solution, and if you want to object, you can. Why not so use Debian Devil now? I was about to say that. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, uh, we can use Debian Devil announce, I just don't want to step on any toes. I think we've uh, the four of us suggest yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, One reason against the develop announce is that it's, it's a list read by 3,500 people. It you know, is the, the, the they general they intimidation the issue. Policy. You don't necessarily <laughs> want uh, everybody to look at you while you make your policy. No, sure. but this is the final yes. stage. This is the last final call. Stage. It's equivalent to an IETF last call. Okay. And the IETF last calls are sent to the whole IETF uh, announce list. And I've got three slides. Maybe we can rush through those and come back to uh, So this is what the trivial policy updates <coughs> we should be able to do. Yeah. Knowing me, you know that there, is, there are going to be typos in policy. I don't want to have to go through the, the whole process just to fix my typos. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of sort of like what we have now. If there is actually policy is wrong about something, we want to, uh, to have a normal bug. We use user tag, like I say, and policy in state A because we don't know what the fix is yet. New gaps in policy or new proposals are going wish list again in state A. If a solution is proposed either initially or just thereafter, we go move over to state B. And I might be over formalizing this user tag a bit. So I'm willing to listen to pushback. This was my first take on the process. This is basically implementing the state diagram mm -hmm. using DTS. Then the discussion occurs, tentative solutions are, or an alternate solutions are proposed. I want a strict time limit for this stage. If we can't find a solution in a month, we might not find a solution. We solicit input for the guys who know what they're doing. They don't have any, they might not want to respond to us. So again, there is a time limit. You ask them, you wait politely for a response for a week or so. If nobody responds, we kind of, you know, move on. We don't let the, the proposal die there. Then again, I want to have sign off so that I know that this is okay. Formal policy language, we have been through this in the previous. Final reviews and discussions are sent at this stage. Again, with a time limit. This is where we kind of publish it, maybe. I'm, this is an ideal that I don't think I have followed in all cases. Because I have usually been from, I've been trying to do this. It should meet the concerns of everybody, which is not always possible. At the end of the discussion period, we need a resolution. We can't just let it stagnate forever. If we believe that uh, we, if the maintainers are satisfied, we can accept it. If the policy maintainers think that proposed change does not meet the concern of all maintainers, etc., and formally no solution has been reached, then we pass the buck. Technical committee or to the developer body for a GR or whatever, what have you, or the social committee. But those things shouldn't actually overcome together. Again, we talked about it, and I think, all right. This is what I had. I went through the state diagrams and I converted it into how you use the BTS user tag to kind of follow the progress of this. So the couple of things that are different from what we currently do is, there's far more involvement of the technical committee. We push things to them when we don't know what the heck is going on, because That's that right. is the body that is set up to do that. Yeah. Secondly, I propose, just like uh, we do for GIs, we set a time limit. We can set a long time limit if people are concerned that there won't be enough discussion. But we should have a finite period where a proposal is either accepted, shot down, or sent on to the technical com committee for review. So I think that's largely excellent and needed. Uh, the one comment I have is that uh, occasionally we're going to, we're probably going to 
find ourselves in situations where we think this is a good idea, but the technology isn't there yet. Um, we may need to account for that by you know, not losing the discussion that took place while we go off and get all of our cards in order, but um, keep, keep the old discussion around somewhere until the technology exists to let us implement this policy proposal. Okay, how would you suggest we do that? We could do it with an additional suspended state and then a, a general policy that uh, once a year we review all suspended bugs and see if we can reopen them. That's one route you can take. Or uh, I have a fear that the suspended state discussions might tend to mm -hmm. accumulate and hang on. Uh, unless you are uh, saying that if at the end of the year it hasn't come out to suspension, we just close it. We could do that. We that could always close it too now and later. Yeah, yeah, sure. We can close it on, um, on archive and reopen it later. Yeah. So, I mean, if, I if in any case the policy is being uh, re, uh, rewritten, well, the, the box uh, concerning the previous policy document uh, will be referring to a non existent document anymore. So. Well, the we, what, what, what we can't throw out the previous box. We do have to go through the previous box yes. and figure out what's Because the bugs are not against the document, the bugs are against policy. And even if we are rewriting the document, the policy is not supposed to be, you know, we are not yeah. going out the policy. Yeah, 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 of course, I, I understand that. But, but in any case, uh, if policy currently is defined as documenting the, the behavior, well, uh, uh, yes, some, some things need to be changed. Uh, maybe what, what should be done is to tell man, uh, maintainers that if you have a pending bug, well, we're starting, starting from scratch, uh, check the proposal, check uh, as it uh, is being uh, uh, formulated, and if your bug still applies, file, file it there because we will be mass closing them. No, I think it should be up to Russ and I to actually look at the bug, make sure that it doesn't apply to the new policy or the issue has been handled, and then either close it saying that this is no longer relevant or close it saying that the new policy addresses your concerns. There, I think there are definitely some stuff certainly in the existing bug database that are clearly reasonable changes that should simply be applied. Um, and I think that some of the stuff that's been around for like nine years that's sitting in open discussion states, we may just close those and say, please start again if you think this is still an issue. But there will um, be some of the It's a great but dumping round. But it has to be done on a bug by yes. case by case basis. And I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to help with the triage and go through all those bugs. <laughs>